We are in Luke chapter 8. If you are new to Caribbean Christian Fellowship, what we do is we work our way through a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and we're working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And last week, we made it about halfway through chapter 8. We made it to through, uh, I think, verse 21. And we talked about the words of Jesus, the power and the emphasis of the words of Jesus, because there are several sections that talked about the power and the importance of his word that were emphasized there, right? We talked about the seed that fell, that was, which was what? What was the seed? Y'all remember the key to the parable? The seed was the word of God. Yes, the word of God, and it falls upon the soil, and the soil are, are different types of people. And we want that seed, the word of God, to fall on the good soil so that it can grow us into mature believers. And Jesus tells us that to take heed to what we hear, that's what he, that was the, kind of the emphasis of that parable. Take heed to what we hear. And what he means is, is we hear the word of God and we obey the word of God. And we talked about last week, when we do that, it helps us to gain a closer relationship with Jesus Christ. But not only that, we talked about how taking heed means that we are also sharing the word of God. We have a responsibility to share the word of God with other people. And as Jesus said in verse 16 of last week, it says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. And so Jesus, last week we talked about how Jesus, uh, his words, the importance and the emphasis of his words. And this week we're going to be talking about the works of Jesus. And so we have the words of Jesus, now we have the works of Jesus. And I sort of led you to believe that we're going to be covering the rest of chapter 8 uh, this week when I, when I was preaching last week. But actually, I'm going to slow it down a little bit because what we have here is really cool stories about the power of Jesus and his works. And this week, we're going to cover two of those events that, that are in the book of Luke, one of them being um, when Jesus calms the storm uh, on the Sea of Galilee, and the other one when Jesus very dramatically uh, frees a demon-possessed man of, of many demons. All right, and so that's where we're going to be diving in. But before we dive into the Word, let me just open this up and give it back to the Lord one more time. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord, I just, I just know that I needed to hear this this morning. I, ne- I needed to have this instowed in my life as I was going over this, and you spoke to me while I was uh, preparing this message, Lord, and I just pray that you speak to those around us, you know, everyone here, uh, Lord, that you have authority and power over all things, Lord, and we don't have to fear certain things that are happening, the storms of our life, we don't have to fear demonic things because your spirit helps guide us, and we have another in the fire, like we said this morning. Lord, we know that you are here with us. Lord, we know that you have a good plan for us. And even like Chris said this morning, that even in the, in the bad things and the storms, we know that you can make us stronger as we endure through that. Lord, I just pray that we're encouraged this morning. Lord, in anything of me, just let it just fall to the ground and, and never remember it again. But Lord, I pray, I pray that your word just penetrates the hearts and we leave here changed, leave here wanting to share the words of God and the hope that we have in Christ because it's such an amazing story, an amazing thing that we could tell people that desperately need to hear it. Lord, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we are in Luke chapter 8, beginning at verse 22. Let's dive in. It says, Now it happened on a certain day that he got in a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us cross over to the other side of the lake. And they launched out. But as they sailed, he fell asleep. Jesus fell asleep. And the windstorm came down the lake, and they were filled, filling with water and were in jeopardy. And so here we see Jesus saying, all right, disciples, let's, let's get in the, this boat, and we're going to go to the other side of the lake. Now, uh, we covered this a, a while back that it says the Sea of Galilee, and it's mentioned as a lake. And I mentioned uh, a while back when we were going through another chapter talking about the Sea of Galilee that it's actually more like a lake because it's fresh water. So if you're a little bit confused there, don't be. It's, it's a Sea of Galilee, but it's more like a lake. So they're calling it a lake here. So, you know, I just don't want anybody to be, you know, distracted by that. So let's just get that distraction out of the way, all right? So it's a lake. But nevertheless, uh, they were on this lake, the Sea of Galilee, and their boat begins to fill with water, and it says that they were in jeopardy, right? 
And much like Jonah was in jeopardy of the storm, uh, these disciples are in jeopardy of a storm. But Jonah was in jeopardy because of his disobedience, and the disciples were in jeopardy because of their obedience. And so that just tells us that no matter what things we're doing in our life, maybe we're in obedience, maybe we're disobedient, storms are going to come in our life. And we can handle them in, in a good way or in a negative way. And so let's, let's dive in and see how they handle it. Uh, so we gather from this that, that Jesus, he falls asleep. He goes, he, he's going to take a little nap. Even though the storm is about to brew, he, he comes and he falls asleep. And one might think, well, why does Jesus need to sleep? He's God, right? Like, why does he even need to sleep? He doesn't need to sleep like me and you. Well, he's showing us his humanity here. And I love this. He's showing, he gets tired and, and would sometimes need to catch up on his sleep. And that, sometimes he does that in, in wherever he can, like on a boat when a storm's about to come. So, uh, and I'm sure that many of you students can relate to this. And, and anyone who works or just has a busy and a stressful life can relate to getting tired. And sometimes we just need to rest, right? That's why, G, why God gave us the Sabbath, right? The day of rest so we can have a day of rest in our life. And I'm also sure that uh, many of you can relate to uh, the stresses and, and things happening in your life where you just can't sleep. You're just losing sleep because of the things going on in your life. It's just so stressful and it's just so uh, in your mind that you can't sleep. And so it's actually impressing that Jesus can, the fact that Jesus can sleep in this boat. I mean, his mind and his heart are peaceful enough in relying and trusting in the love and care of his heavenly Father that he could sleep during the storm that was coming. And also, Jesus always knows in the back of his mind what's coming down the pipe, right? He knows that he's going to have to go on the cross. And even knowing this, and even knowing the storms are coming, he's able to sleep. He's at peace. And that's amazing. Now, the Sea of Galilee was actually known for its um, sudden storms, right? Violent storms. And so the severity of this storm is actually very relevant uh, to how the disciples react to it. Because if you remember, um, where did he get some of his disciples, right? They were fishermen on this very sea. And so they would have been used to these storms that are coming up because it very, happens very often. So the severity of this storm is very prevalent in the reaction that we see in verse 24. And so let's, let's take a look at the reaction here in verse 24. And they came to him and woke him up. It's saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. Notice that they say, we are perishing. Then he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the water, and they ceased. And there was a calm. I love that. There was a calm. Like, just like that, calm. I love it. But he said to them, where's your faith? And they were afraid and marveled, saying to one another, who is this? For he commands even the winds and the waters, and they obey him. And so... We see the severity of the storm because they come to him and they wake him up and say, hey, we're perishing. How can you sleep, essentially? What are you doing? Wake up. <laughs> and the disciples didn't take comfort in the sleeping Jesus knowing that, hey, if he's able to sleep, everything's going to be okay because Jesus said that we're going to go to the other side, right? Because in all appearances, they were going under. They're the experienced fishermen. The water's getting in the boat. We're perishing. Where's your faith? That's what Jesus says. Where's your faith? Obviously, they weren't listening in verse 22 when Jesus said, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Because just like we talked about last week, the emphasis and the power and the authority of Jesus is what? His words, right? And if Jesus says, hey, we're going to go to the other side, there's no way that that boat is going down. And so the fact that they say this is, is kind of is saying, hey, we don't, we don't believe it, that you, what your words and saying that you were going to go to the other side. You know, last week he said this. He said, uh, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear. And obviously these disciples didn't hear, weren't listening very carefully when he said this. They, had the, they showed their lack of faith. That's why he asked them, where's your faith? Because he said, let's go over. Let's go over to the other side. And I, wanted you, and I pointed out that they said we. I wanted you to realize that they said we. They said, master, master, we are perishing. And so not only were they talking about themselves, but they were talking about Jesus. And so the fact that they said we, that Jesus is even perishing, they, that was even showing the lack of faith of who Jesus was himself. Because think about it. If it all went down with the boat, all, if everything in the boat went down, Jesus' mission, right? His, the, their hopes of the great ministry that he's called them in to do with him, it would be all 
perishing. It would be hopeless. And, and so when I think about this, and I think about our own lives, I think about how, I know I, know I can do this, and, I, and I, maybe you can too, just be over-anxious about what the Lord is doing in your life. You know, and, and especially in the hour of a storm when things in your life just aren't going quite right. And you just imagine everything is just falling apart. Everything is perishing. And, and so during those storms of life, we too have to ask us the same question that the, that the disciples got asked by Jesus. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? And notice that Jesus doesn't merely quiet the winds and the seas. And I think this is important to, to realize this. It says that he arose and rebuked the wind and the raging of the sea. And so the fact that he rebukes the winds and the sea, and we see that the, the disciples' great fear in this raging storm, and, and the things that Jesus is about to confront on the other side of the lake is this demon-possessed person, then all these things put together give us a sense that Satan had a significant hand in this storm. I mean, one biblical scholar, Adam, Adam Clark, he says this to the storm, and I like it. He says, probably excited by Satan, the prince of the power of the air, who having the author, having Jesus, right, and, and all the preachers of the gospel together in this small vessel, thought by drowning it to defeat the purpose of God. That's always what his goal is. Satan's purpose is to defeat the purpose of God and thus to prevent the salvation of a ruined world. And what a noble opportunity must this have appeared to the enemy of the human race. But when we look at Jesus in this, he doesn't say, oh man, wow, what a storm. He looks at his disciples and he says, where's your faith? You see, this storm could not disturb Jesus. But you know what can? The unbelief of his disciples. And it did. And I think it's important to say that different circumstances, when we go through certain things in our life, there's many times where we think that, oh, I, maybe there's something, I'm, I'm, I'm not believing enough because so, I'm going through this circumstance. But the storm, so to speak, are not evidence of unbelief. They're not evidence of unbelief. Unbelief is rejecting of the promise or the command of God in a certain situation, right? And so these disciples should have known when God uh, that God would not allow the Messiah to perish on the Sea of Galilee, right? That it is not possible for the story of Jesus to end here because his story will go on, as we know, and he goes to the cross. And so, I, you know, I don't know about you, but I take courage by this. I take so much courage because it shows that his abiding care for us, for those that he loves, his people, as Jeremiah 29, 11 says, this is a promise. It says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. And so Jesus calms the sea, and he rebukes the winds. And his disciples, what did they do? Well, they, they marveled and they feared. The total calm of the sea should have given, brought them peace because there was this raging sea, but it didn't. It didn't calm their hearts. They were just as afraid as when Jesus did this, as it seems as they were when the storm was raging. The disciples were amazed. So such a powerful display was, was given over creation that they asked, who could this be? Well, let me tell you, it could only be the Lord, Jehovah, who has this authority and this power. And so this just points to Jesus and his deity, right? As Psalms 89, uh, 8 and 9 say, O Lord, God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule the ragings of the sea when waves rise, you steal them. That's what Jesus does right here, right? And so in just a few moments, these disciples see the, the complete humanity of Jesus and that he gets tired and he falls asleep, but they also see his fullness of his deity and how he calms the raging sea. And so they saw who Jesus really is, truly man and truly God. That's who Jesus is. And so after he calms the sea and, and, and the winds, he continues to sail to the country of the Gadareans. And so let's take a look at what happens in verse 26. It says, Then they sailed to the country of the Gadareans, which is opposite of Galilee. And when he stepped out on the land, there met him a certain man from the city who had demons for a long time. And he wore no clothes, nor did he live in a house, but in the tombs. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out, fell down before him, and with a loud voice said, What have I to do with you? And get this, he says his name, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, I beg you, do not torment me. 
And why is he saying this to Jesus? Verse 29, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had often seized him, and he was kept under guard, bound in chains and shekels, and he broke the bonds and was driven by the demons into the wilderness. Now, the most estimates will say that the country of the Gadareans is on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee, and it was a mostly Gentile territory. That means it was, it was a non-Jewish territory. It's kind of a hint, so I, as we'll see here, that they had maybe they were raising pigs uh, because it wouldn't be kosher for, or for Jews to do that. And it says, there, he, there met him a certain man from a city who had demons for a long time. Now, interestingly, this describes the most detailed uh, demon-possessed man, demon possession that we see in all the Bible. It's a classic profile of demon possession. And so Luke tells us this man had been possessed for a long time. So these demons had control uh, of some, some kind of things going on in him for a really long time. This man, he wore no clothes, so he's naked. He lived amongst the animals like a wild animal. More like a wild animal. And it says... Nor did he live in a house driven by demons into the wilderness. And he was a man living among the decaying and the dead, right? Contrary to the Jewish law or just human decency or human instinct, you know, we're not going to go live in a cemetery, right? But this man, it says he lived in the tombs. And he had supernatural strength. It says that he broke the bonds. And we actually read in other Gospels, and in in Mark chapter 5 tells us he had uncontrollable behavior. It says neither could anyone uh, tame him. But it also says he was self-destructive. He says, the crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, I would imagine that this man didn't start out this way, right? I imagine that he probably was just a normal person living in the village with the other villagers. But in his own irrational and wild behavior, it convinced the villagers that he was demon-possessed, or at least crazy, or at least insane, right? And they bound him with chains and kept him from hurting anyone, but he broke those chains time and time again, and then he was driven out into, to live in the village cemetery where he can on, only hurt the one person. That's himself. He couldn't hurt anybody else. But I want you to notice in verse 27, it says, There met him a certain man. And so this meant that Jesus did not go and seek out this man. This man was drawn to Jesus. And so what did Jesus do? This man comes to him, and he, he commands the unclean spirit to come out of the man. And the man could not and would not deliver himself. It was impossible for this man, but Jesus had the authority and the power over this unclean spirit. And because Jesus commanded the unclean spirit to come out of this man, he said to Jesus, what, what have I to do with you? I beg you, do not torment me. He's begging Jesus not to torment him. So obviously he had some kind of power to do so, right? And so this was a demonic spirit within the possessed man, right? It was, the, it was not the man himself, but it was the demon not wanting to leave the inhabited body. And so what we can gather from this and other de- demonic possessions is that de- demonic possession is when a demonic spirit arises in a human body and at times will exhibit its own personality through the personality of those, the, uh, the body, that, the host body. And believe it or not, demonic possession is a reality today. And we must guard against either ignoring the activity or just uh, or overemphasizing it, right? We don't want to give it more credit than, than it's worth. But this begs the question, how does a person become demon-possessed? Because I don't want to be demon-possessed, right? Now, I'm sure none of you want to be demon-possessed. So how does one become demon-possessed? Well, we're not told specifically how someone becomes demon-possessed besides um, allowing those things in. Like by, like, by the things that we allow ourselves to be exposed to. I think it's very important that we don't allow ourselves to be exposed to things that, that are, are evil, right? Like, for example, uh, superstitions, fortune-telling, so-called uh, harmless occult games, uh, practice spiritualism, new age uh, deception, magic, drugs, all those things are ways to open up doors to deception to a believer, and they can be absolutely detrimental and a danger to a non-believer. You know, people often get involved with these occults or, or demonic things because they think that something is, is, seems to work. But unfortunately, it's not something, but someone. It's an evil spirit. It's a demon, demonic spirit. 
And so we can say that de demons want to inhabit bodies for the same reason that a vandal wants a spray can or, or a robber wants a gun. It's, we're, we're, the, the demons want to use us as a tool, right? Uh, we wanna, they want to use us and so they can attack God. It's an attack against God. And we can say that demons also attack men because they hate the image of God that we are made in. And so they're going to try to destroy that image and, and, and debase the man and make him grotesque. And then we see a prime example of this with this man that we're reading about today. The demons also have the same um, goal for Christians, to wreck the image of God. But fortunately for us, their tactics are restricted because of what Jesus did. In regards to Christians, demonic spirits were disarmed at the work of the cross. And praise God for that. Colossians 2.15 says, having disarmed principalities and powers. That's talking about evil spirits, right? He made a public specter of them, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. But I will say that they can both deceive and, Im and imitate or intimidate Christians, Right? So we still need to be careful because they can bind us with fear and unbelief in our lives. And I think it's ironic that they're begging Jesus not to torment him when they've themselves been tormenting this man for many years. It's, it's quite uh, 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 just ironic because they've been attacking this, this guy in his mind and his body and his soul for so long. And here they are, oh, I know we've been doing this, but you know, please don't do anything to me. You know? <laughs> I think that's, that's ironic. And these demons' response to Jesus, uh, when he says, come out of him, he says, come out of this man, I think this is a way that they tried to resist the works of Jesus. Because right? they uh, noticed that they called him by his name, right? They said, they said uh, Jesus, the son of the most high God. So they knew exactly who he was. You know, the people around may not have known exactly who he was, but these demons knew exactly who he was. And this is actually a way for them to resist the works of Jesus. See, because in the background of all this, the ancient superstition was that a spiritual power, you would have spiritual power over uh, something that you would have, if you knew their name or said their name. And so this was a way of the unclean spirits to address Jesus in his full, by doing that, Jesus, the Son of Most High, because according to the superstitions, this would have been like a shot fired at Jesus, right? This is like, you know, we got you. We know your name. And I think about this, and I think about what we talked about in the book of James. Because in their address of Jesus, they have the, light, the right theological fact, right? They know exactly who he is, but they don't have the right heart. And in James, when we went over the James, in, in James 2, 19 through 20, he said this, you believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and they tremble. That's what we're seeing them doing right here. They're trembling. They're saying, don't torment us. But then he says in verse 20, but do you not know, O foolish man, that faith without works is dead? See, these demons inhabited, uh, inhabiting this man, they had a kind of faith in Jesus, and that faith was that they knew who Jesus was, but they didn't show it in their faith. And so it was a dead faith, not a saving one. And so we see in verse 30, Jesus demonstrates his power and authority over these evil spirits. Let's look at it. Jesus asked him, saying, what is your name? And he said, legion, because many demons had entered him. And they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. Now a herd of many swine was feeding there on the mountain. So they begged him that they would permit him to enter them, and he permitted, he permitted them. Notice that he permitted them there, right? We'll, we'll talk about that. And then the demons went out of the man and entered the swine, and the herd ran violently down, and uh, down the steep place into the lake, and they drowned. So the first thing we see here is Jesus asked the demons, well, what's your name? What is your name? And we see that the answer to Jesus' question was legion, for many demons had entered him. Entered him. Now, like I said earlier, according to the Jewish exorcist uh, of, that, of that time, one had to know the name of the demon in order to gain authority over it and to deliver the demon-possessed person. But I want you to notice something. Jesus doesn't use the name to, do, to deliver this man. He doesn't use it. One... You know, 
And since Jesus didn't use the, na the name to, to free this man, well, why did, he, why did he even ask his name? Well, I think he asked his name so that we, and those people around him who were witnessing this, and we who are reading about this, would know the extent of the problem. See, this man was really messed up. He didn't just have one demon. He had many demons. There were so many demons in this guy. You know, and, and, he says, and it says that word legion, right? And some of you may know of, have heard of the Roman legion, right? And, and a Roman legion, there was a, a 6,000 men. It consists of 6,000 men. Now, I'm not saying that there's 6,000 demons living inside this man. We don't know how many, but we know that there are many. And it's interesting that, that legion is not actually a name. It's not actually a name. It was more like an indirect response that they're giving Jesus. It, it was more like a, a threat. I'm going to say it was a threat, an attempt to, again, intimidate Jesus, just like that storm was meant to intimidate the, 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 them and, and the boat. Now, now these demons are trying to intimidate Jesus. Um, <laughs> It very well could be that this is an attempt to intimidate Jesus. I, I would be, it would be like, um, I don't know if you've ever seen like a, a cornered animal who's about to be attacked and, and they know they're, they're doomed. What do they do? They kind of get, try to get as big as they possibly can to, to kind of try to free themselves or scare the, the other uh, thing that's attacking them away. Or like when my, when my kid, uh, you know, they're going to get in trouble. So they get real loud to try to, to get me to stop me from uh, from from disciplining them or something like that. So these, these many demons had tried to get this massive claim and the mistaken idea that they could intimidate Jesus. But does it work? Of course not. <laughs> There's no way. Because, and, but according to the superstitions of that day, the people that were standing by and witnessing this, well, it would seem like that the demons had the upper hand here. I mean, first of all, they knew his name. They said his full name. And secondly, they kind of uh, gave him a, a roundabout way of saying their name. He didn't really give them their name. He gave them a, it was an indirect response. So they didn't give them, the demons didn't give them their name. And finally, they tried to frighten Jesus with their many numbers. And so Jesus doesn't buy into that, right? Jesus, no way. There's no, no way he bought into the superstitions at all. And it was easy for him to cast out this unclean spirit out of this afflicted man. <laughs> and we see in verse 31 that, they, that these demons, they realized it too. They said, beg, they begged him that he would not command them to go into the abyss. Now, that begs the question, what is the abyss? We talked about the, the abyss when, at Life Group when we are in the book of Revelation. And the abyss, in other places of the New Testament, it, it is called the bottomless pit. All right, and, and it is clear in Scripture that God has ultimate power over evil spirits. And, and some demons, we know through Scripture, have been sent to the abyss where they are, are in chains and they're in captive there, while others, like the ones that we're reading about here, are able to kind of roam around and they're freely upon the earth. And so the demons in the abyss had no power until the moment of their release at the end times. And as we read in Revelation 9, in the book of Revelations 9, we read that an angel is given the key. So just like the, uh, he gives them permission to go into the pigs, they have the permission to get out of the abyss. And, and during that time of the great tribulation at the end times, when judgment comes upon the earth, and he opens the abyss, and when he does, all these creatures that John graphically describes in the book of Revelation are freed from the abyss, and they are beginning to attack uh, men and women on the earth. But notice here that these, these demons are begging Jesus not to command them at this time to go into the abyss. And so they know that there's a time that's going to come where they, they will be sent to the abyss. And so they're begging for, for, for further liberties here. We want to keep roaming the earth. And interesting enough, Jesus actually gave it to them, right? He didn't at this time send them to the abyss. However, they will have their time when Satan is bound, as we read in Revelation 20.10. It says, The devil who deceived them has cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. But in verse 30, when the demons ask to go into the swine, Jesus grants the request. It says, The demons went out of the man and entered the swine. 
Now, right about this time, I'm tempted to give a dad joke about uh, deviled ham, but, I, but I'm going to you know, refrain from that because obviously no one laughs at that joke. And so, but I'm just going to keep going. On a, on a more serious note, all right, on a more serious note, I want you to notice that demons can't even affect the pigs without the permission of Jesus. And that, that's an amazing thing for us to realize. And, and I like what William Clark says on this. He says, since the demons cannot enter even into swine with without being sent by God himself, how little is the power or malice of them to be dreaded by those who have God as their portion and their protector. Man, I love that. I don't know about you, but that brings me a lot of comfort knowing that I am sealed by the Holy Spirit and protected from those, from those evil attacks upon my life. And I don't want to allow them to even come near me. But do you ever wonder why, why Jesus even allowed them to go into the swine? Why didn't he send them to the abyss? Well, one reason may be because the time of total demonstration of his authority over the demons had not yet come. That ultimately comes on the cross, like we read in that Colossians 2.15, where he uh, disarms demons and their attacks and, and makes a public spectrum of them at the cross. And so these demons were cast into the swine, and look what happens as we continue reading verse 33. He says, The herd ran violently down the steep place into the lake and drowned. And so what does this tell us about the nature of demons, right? Well, we see the destructive nature of demonic spirits and their effect on the swine. They're just like Satan. They're, out to, they're seeking to steal, kill, and destroy, as it says in John 10.10. 10. And this also helps explain why Jesus allowed these demons to enter the pig. Another reason, because he wanted everyone there to know and us to know the real intentions of these evil demons, they wanted to destroy the man just like they destroyed the, that pig, those pigs. But because the man was made in the image of God, they could not have their way as easily with the man as they did with the pigs. But their intention was just the same, to completely destroy him. And let me tell you, this makes me even more grateful that I have God on my side, that I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so starting in verse 34, we see the reaction of these bystanders who are seeing, seeing all this, this crazy uh, man being demon-free. We see the reaction. Uh, let's look at it in verse 34. It says, When those who fed them saw what was happening had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. And then they went out to see what had happened and came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had departed, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus gives us back our sanity. I love that. Not only from, from demons and the insanityness of that, but also the insanity of things that we're allowing in our life that we shouldn't be. It doesn't have to be just demons, but just things that, that are, you know, sins. And we talk about this at Celebrate Recovery all the time. He gives us our sanity back. But look what it says. It says, they were afraid. They also, who had seen it, told them by what means he who had been demon-possessed was healed. Then the whole, get this, the whole multitude of the surrounding region of the Gadareans asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. And so what did he do? He got into the boat and he left. He returned. And so there's a lot to unfold here. First of all, do you notice how afraid the people were of the man who was once had demons, that he was freed? They were afraid of him. Now, you may think, oh, wait a minute. Why, wouldn't they be more afraid of him when he was demon-possessed? No. I mean, we're used to that. That's, that's just the guy. He's just living in the cemetery. You know, that's, that's just the crazy guy, you know, the, the, the town crazy. You know, that, that, that would have been the normal thing. What they were afraid of was a man who was set free by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. That's what's at work right here, the power and the authority of Jesus and secondly, I want you to notice that Jesus brings the whole city together. The whole city, verse 37. Then the whole multitude of the surrounding regions of the Gadareans asked him to depart from them. Now, he brought the whole city together and they had a prayer meeting. Now, prayer is asking things of Jesus, right? And so they have this prayer meeting and they ask Jesus, hey, we want you to leave. We don't want you here. We, we, you're disturbing our status quo. We'd rather have a demon-possessed man and keep our pigs. We want, uh, we, we want our, our livelihood more than we want people freed from demons. And so they ask him to leave. He unifies the whole multitude, but not in a good way. 
And when people are more afraid of what Jesus will do in their life and then what Jesus will do at the moment, they often will try to push Jesus away. You know, just like we talked about with the, the seed falling on the soil, right? With the, the parable of the soil. Unbelief, temptations of this world, the, the desires and pleasures of this world will cause us to push Jesus away and pursue those things. And it's so dangerous. Because you know what's scary? I'm going to tell you the scary thing, what it says here. And he got in the boat and he returned. That's what's scary to me. Jesus left, he di didn't he? he? He's not going to force himself onto anybody. And so he left. It's almost as if like, you don't want me here? Well, I'm going to go somewhere where they want me. And so he left. And so we see the reactions of the bystanders here. But, but I want to close our time with the reaction of the, the man. The man who was demon-possessed that Jesus freed. I want, to hear, I want you to see his reaction in verse 30, 38 and 39. So now the man from whom the demons had departed begged him that he might be with him. He wanted to go with Jesus, right? But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. And he went his way and proclaimed throughout the whole city the great things Jesus has done for him. Now, I want you to notice here, about three times in, in just a few verses, this man was called by the title, the man from whom the demons had departed. That, it's like it becomes his new name. And what a great name that is, right? It, hey, what's your name? I'm the man whom the demons departed. It was like it became his testimony. And what a beautiful testimony it was. They're gone. I'm set free. Look, I'm not crazy. I'm not trying to, uh, I'm not ripping my clothes off. I'm not trying to... Uh, be weird. I don't know. I'm not doing all those things anymore. I'm different. And it's amazing, the thing to see. And it's interesting that he wanted to go with Jesus. Of course he did, right? And you'd think that it would be like he went with Jesus, he became one of the apostles, and he replaced Judas after he betrayed him. You'd think that's how the story goes. But no, Jesus says in verse 39, return to your own house and tell what great things God has done for you. You know, sometimes the, the godliest, most missional thing you can do is stay home, stay where you're at, and look around at the people who desperately need Jesus in their life. You don't have to become a missionary. Just look around. God has you where you're at for a purpose, right? And, and you've heard me say this many times, that I have influence, yeah, and I'm, I praise God for the influence that he's given me, but you have influence that far outreaches my influence or outreaches anybody's other, anybody else's influence. And so, the influences that we have and the places that we're, we're at, God wants us to speak those things, speak of the good things that God has done in our life to other people. It's so important. That's what we talked about last week. We have a mission to do exactly that. And so Jesus says, no, you stay here. I want you to tell the people around you, yes, I know I freed you. I, I know that you have this great story to tell, but I want you to stay right here and tell the people that have asked me to leave because, hey, you have influence in their life still. They, they may not see it now, but when you're not being crazy in, in the cemetery, they're going to realize it, and then you can speak the truth of God in their life. That's what Jesus wanted this man to do. And that's what he wants all of us to do, to speak his truth, to speak the truth of his power and his authority and his, and, and his word and his actions. But also Jesus is doing something else for this man. Jesus also is letting this man know, hey, you don't need me around to walk in your freedom, to walk in your deliverance. You know, I'll leave and you'll still be demon free. And the man was. And the last thing I want to mention before we uh, do our communion this week is Jesus told this man to go tell the great things that God has done for you, right? But what did the man do? It says that he went his way proclaiming throughout the whole city the great things that Jesus has done for you. He proclaims the great things Jesus has done. And so Jesus told him to do, tell people about what God has done, and he tells them what great things Jesus has done. So we can put those two things together, and we can say that Jesus is God. We see it through his actions. We see it through his words that Jesus is God. So that's what I want to leave us with this morning is that Jesus is God. And because Jesus is God, he has so much mightier than any demonic power. And so we put our focus on him and the work 
that he did on the cross. And yes, we may have to contend with demonic spirits in our life, but we can never have to fear them because Jesus gave us the victory on the cross.